Welcome to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage. I'm here to give you a front row seat to the Emmys, Oscars, SAG, and Tony's races. Who is in the running? What makes an award-worthy performance? And what are the secrets to giving one? intimate, inspirational conversations with some of today's most talented stars provide you, dear listener, the kind of craft and career advice that could win you a statue of your own, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. If I was a young actor starting out right now, the thing I would focus mostly on would be finding a community of people who I want to work with and then finding ways to get our work our work done. Mm-hmm. Even if that's, you know, wherever that happens, you know, put it out there, make it, don't wait. Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of In the Envelope. We are recording live from a certain backstage office, the backstage office, and I am joined by a very special guest, co-host, core team podcast member, and in fact, I'm going to ask you, like, what was your role in the creation of this podcast? Casey Howe is here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. (laughs) You you may have actually seen this fantastic conference room on some of our Facebook (gasps) Live. Look at you already plugging other backstage products. You know, (laughs) just just here a little a little here and there. Who knows? That's right. Here we are in the green room. (laughs) That way they can visualize it. That's right. And and I think that we actually uh, have might have this set up for future recordings. We're gonna have more guest hosts, perhaps. Yeah. Jamie's gonna still check in, Jamie and I. Sometimes I might be solo. Sometimes I might be joined by Casey. Um, Casey, what do you do at Backstage? Um, I work with our uh, studio and network partners um, Mm -hmm. around media to try and reach our audience and try and let our audience know what films and television shows they have coming out and what are contenders. And Mm -hmm. we try and do that through media, much like you try and do that with editorial. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Casey and I work together to... Unite editorial and advertising, which is in a very, it's very exciting these days. Well, it's just a nicer presentation for everyone, right? When they can mm-hmm. read the editorial, see the advertising as yes. a compliment rather than something so intrusive. So totally. the more we can integrate the two, the better. Totally. Um, and Casey and I, we have a lot of discussions about the Oscar race, of course, and, and the Emmy race and the SAG race and the Tony's race. Yes. Um, each year. And so this is a particularly exciting, but also busy time yes. for us. Yes. <laughs> um, in the week before the Oscars. Oh. What are you, what, let's talk about the Oscars. What are you, what is this paper you have in front of you? Oh, I you have. You have the nominees. Yes, I have the nominees. Amazing. Just so we're not quizzing ourselves. But yes. we also probably just have them. <laughs> yes. Internal. Because <laughs> this is such a fun year. Like um, we were saying, it's a very varied year and it's unclear what the Oscars are going to crown. Yeah. There's no front runner. There's no consensus in the precursor awards this yeah. year. Yeah. No, I think I think that's been really fun for people. Oh, yeah. You know, probably a little more stressful for some of the awards consultants than they would like. Sure. <laughs> but I think um I think it's been fun to watch just because you know, the guilds have sort of divvied up their awards. Yeah. And I think, you know, the SAG results were really impactful, so you kind of have Everybody's got a shot, and that's really yeah. fun. Yeah, it's that really fun. fun. So yeah. um, I think that's just kept um, kept the Oscar race as far as you know the industry is concerned. You know, people are still pushing; they're still going for it. Totally. So so that's always fun. Sometimes you have you know your clear front runner, and you kind of know what's going to happen, and and that's fine too. But I think that sure. um, these types of years are always are always fun when. Um, when you're still so deep into award season and it's still like, I don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. <laughs> it's happening in less than a week. Here we yeah. are. We're recording this on Monday before the Oscars um, and the Spirit Awards. They're both this weekend. And there's no telling who's who's going to take what. Yeah. It's and really exciting. post WGA that you were at. The little, WGA little plug Awards. for Jack on the That's Red right. Carpet. <laughs> That's right. I was there last night. Um, there, there are two ceremonies in, the, in LA and in New York. I was in New York. And... Um, 
eighth grade mm-hmm. from age 24 won this original screenplay prize, which is sort of their biggest one. Yeah. And Can You Ever Forgive Me won for adapted screenplay. And that yes. does shake up the race even more because yeah. neither of those are nominated for the Oscar for Best Picture. <laughs> And eighth grade wasn't even nominated for any Oscars. I know. So, I know. <laughs> but we had friend of the podcast, Elsie Fisher, joining us. Yes. And that was really lovely. Yes. Um, which reminds me, I have to say, who today's guest is, which is important. <laughs> um, we have Andre Holland joining us today for the Netflix film, yes. High Flying Bird. Mm-hmm. Usually, So usually, we book these guests pegged to their awards campaign mm-hmm. for like Emmys, what we call phase one, or for... Oscars phase two if they're nominated for an Oscar. But Andre is in the film High Flying Bird, which came out on Netflix a couple weeks ago. So this is pretty much our first episode that's pegged to release. A little bit, yeah. Which we're yeah. hoping to do more of. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Andre Holland, how, do you, how can you say no? We, I mean, he's so amazing. <laughs> and technically, High Flying Bird is up for next year's Oscars. So true. So might as well just do an early, early Oscars. Why not? Fight. Why not? Um, before we go to the Andre interview... Just tell us a little bit about the creation of this podcast, because oh. it's been very much a team effort, yes. but the initial seeds were planted by yourself. Yes. Well, I, so it's sort of a pet project because I love podcasts. You so do, yes. I do. I love me a podcast. Murder podcast. <laughs> Who More does like it? serial killer, like horror? <laughs> that's Casey's world. But I think that, you know, I wanted us to venture into this new medium. We mm-hmm. didn't have a podcast. We had, you know, some of the Facebook Live stuff and we were getting into yeah. that. But I just thought that it was something that um, would really bring us closer to the audience and give us a voice mm-hmm. and give us a just a different channel and a different mm-hmm. medium. And um and some of our, you know, network partners were were really into it and wanted to kind of take the leap with us. So um, that's always helpful when you have, you know, a partner that wants to get involved too. So, um, you know, HBO was our first partner sponsor when totally. we first did this for Emmys, I guess, two years ago. Now it's almost two years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So um, that was really, really helpful to sort of get it oh, off yeah. the ground. And then um, now it's just been fun and it's a part of what we do here. And, totally. And hopefully Hopefully we'll we'll do more and we'll do more that are absolutely connected to awards season. Then also what else is happening throughout the year? Totally. You know, so um, I'm I'm looking forward to it continuing to grow yes. and also Baby us, steps. yeah, and us launching. I think um, keep an eye out everybody for our new Facebook uh, and Twitter feeds and things like that that are dedicated yes. exclusively to the podcast. Look at you! So I think that will be really fun to see. You know, to get everybody's feedback and learn yeah. more about what you guys want and how we can, you know, make it better. So I think that'll be super fun. Yeah. It's all about the community engagement going forward. Exclusive content. Yeah. Letting you guys ask questions. Totally. You know, things like that. I think that will be really fun just to keep, just to get a broader conversation going. So um, I think, I think 2019 is the year of more in the envelope. That's right. (laughs) Our world domination continues. (laughs) Um, This is so lovely. Thank you for like, Stepping into conference room two. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so host. honored. I'm so honored. You've been in the credits every episode, <laughs> and now people finally get to hear your voice. Yay. We love you. Everybody is so wonderful. And Jack, <laughs> I just can't thank you enough. You're such a fantastic host. And thank you, Casey. You've really taken this and run with it. Yes. And, yes. J- and Jamie, you're our hero. Oh, and Jamie. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We're going to send you this file now. I hope it sounds okay. I hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> If you love indie films, be sure to check out this year's Film Independent Spirit Awards. Aubrey Plaza hosts a party on the beach for the brightest stars in independent cinema. Watch the Film Independent Spirit Awards live on IFC and Facebook Watch, Saturday, February 23rd at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. See the nominees and prep for the big event at spiritawards.com.
Andre Holland has turned in consistently compelling performances on both stage and screen, 42, Selma, The Nick, and now the Stephen King-inspired series Castle Rock on Hulu, and he's only just getting started. Along with his cast members in Barry Jenkins' Oscar-winning Moonlight, he won the Robert Altman Ensemble Award at the 2017 Film Independent Spirit Awards. He now leads the Steven Soderbergh and Terrell Alvin McCraney film High Flying Bird on Netflix, a sports drama with a story suggested by Andre himself. Here it is, our chat with the wonderful Andre Holland. Your movie was made on iPhone. Wait, so is there anything different about acting for an iPhone than acting for a regular camera? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I mean, I think the process is still pretty much the same. Yeah. It takes a little getting used to because you're used to seeing such uh-huh. heavy equipment. Um, huh. But, you know, once you adjust to it, I think it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. The size of the lens is not necessarily a factor in your yeah. style. Yeah, your, exactly. Yeah. And in a way, I mean, I think it's quite cool because the camera can be, the iPhone can be so discreet. You can sort of put it anywhere and mm. it's easy to forget about it, forget that to it's forget. there. forget. Yeah, yeah, which is always nice. And maybe like lose yourself in the scene. Yeah, yeah, wow. a little bit. Uh, do you do that? Do you have the thing of like... Um, you're totally in the moment. <laughs> How in I the mean, moment are you? <laughs> you know, it depends. I mean, I try to be. I think that's um, yeah, definitely the goal. But you know, it's old acting teacher of mine used to say it's like riding a horse. You know, you, you ride for a little while and then it kicks you off, and then you you got to fight to get oh. you get your way back on it. You know, and it's a bit like that. I think. And you're never at a point where you've mastered the no. riding the horse. These, I haven't. Maybe there are some actors who have, <laughs> but not me. Uh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Um. This is so, this. Thank you for being here. Of course, this is great. Of course, on your full day of press of for course. this movie. Oh, thank you, man. Are we rolling already? Or not? I think we are. Yeah, we oh, don't no. need headphones. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, I have so many questions for you. Uh, but I, I can we start at the beginning? Yeah, for because sure. we're backstage and we love hearing the like origin stories. <laughs> um, especially because I hear you were in like a your your first school play was like it was a moment. It was right. a moment. Yeah, <laughs> it, definitely a moment. It lit the fire. Yes. And yeah. it was, what was the production? It was Oliver. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and it wasn't even really a school play. It was like a community theater production. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, my mother and my father signed me up for it um, when I was, I don't even know how old I was. I was a young kid, probably yeah. 9 or 10, I guess, or 11. I don't know. I was quite young. And uh, where I grew up in Alabama was a town called Bessemer, mm-hmm. which is... Um, south of the city of Birmingham, about 45 minutes south of Birmingham. And we don't really have a lot of arts programming in sure. Bessemer. But my, my parents sent me to this program that was in this place in near downtown Birmingham. It was a bit of a fancy, um, the white area of town. Let's just be <laughs> candid. And uh, I was the only black boy in the group. Wow. And, uh, and I, my character was called Hans. I was one of the little street urchins. <laughs> Hans! <laughs> yeah, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, and my, I remember my, we had a, a really great director, this this guy who um, named James Hatcher, who was kind of a legend in Birmingham, oh, cool. as, you know, putting on th- on plays, and uh, he was very very passionate about it. And I remember he would he would always, or my mother would always come to the rehearsals. She'd sit in the back and watch us rehearse in the darkness, and whereas most parents mm-hmm. would kind of let their kids go and pick them oh. up later, my mom was always there. And, and one day I remember Hatcher got up there, and we were doing one number, and. He jumped up out of his seat and said, Andre, if you don't smile, I'm going to come up there and <gasps> pinch your little cheeks. And my mom jumped up out of the Uh-oh. back of the theater and said, no, you not. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that, that, that poured him back in the jug. <laughs> but also that was your first note. First so note, you're... yeah, exactly. Uh, first first note. But, uh, <laughs> but it also taught me that, you know, listen to mama first. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and it sounds like, so did they sign you up because they sensed that that was something you would really latch on to? Um, I think so. I think it was it was probably that. Um, I talked a lot as a kid, which is not what I do now as an adult, but I used to run uh-huh. my mouth all the time. Hmm. And um, it was always like, you know, I, my grandfather was a preacher, and so we do this thing around the house where I would impersonate preachers. Uh, okay. And so my that was something my parents, my dad especially, always got a kick out of. Mm-hmm. Was, Come on, you know, get up there and preach. And so we, you know. Uh, but then I think also, like I said, in the neighborhood I grew up in, there wasn't a whole lot going on. You sure. know what I mean? And so I think that my mother just read, read the newspaper every day, cover to cover, and 
anytime she saw something that seemed interesting, mm-hmm. she was going to make us go do it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, that was just one of many things that, that we tried when we, when I, well, that I tried when I was a kid. Yeah, because I'm always interested in, in hearing on, on this podcast, too. It's it's an emerging theme of, like, when did it happen for you? When were you bit by the bug? And sometimes it is the parent almost making the bug bite you mm-hmm. <laughs> or detecting that in you yeah, and then helping it come out. Yeah, I think so. And that really did, that was that was it, right? Like, you were from then on, you were, did you want to be an actor? Yeah, but I mean, you know what's funny, man? In a way, I did. I, I enjoyed the experience. Um but if I'm fully honest with you, it wasn't until I was in college, you know, when I got ready to go to college, my mm-hmm. senior year of high school, I didn't really have a plan for myself. I didn't really know what I was going to do. Sure. And um, I had taken some drama classes in high school and done a couple of plays. Mm-hmm. Although I was also playing baseball and doing other things. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, my drama teacher, Mr. Revel, said to me one day, he said, well, you know, have you, have you, what's your plan next year? What are you going to do? I said, well, man, to tell you the truth, I don't know. Mm-hmm. He said, well, have you ever thought about studying theater in, in college? And I didn't know you could do that. And I didn't you know said that no, a, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that anybody could, I didn't know there was a curriculum for theater in college, sure. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so he said, well, there is, and, and I went to a school, Florida State, they have a great program, mm-hmm. you should check it out. So I went home and told my mama. She started up the Dodge Caravan, we drove down to Florida, had a cool. look around, and she uh-huh. said, what you think? I said, well, I think I like it. She said, well, let's figure out how to get you down here. Okay. And so um, they paid, my parents paid for that first you know, sort of year of school. Uh-huh. And um, or semester really. Well, I say year. They paid that. They helped me that first year, and then um, I just kept begging the theater department to let me audition for the BFA program. They finally did. I got in, and then they um, they ended up giving me a scholarship. And so I said all that to say that while I loved acting, you know, I I I I liked acting. Let me say, and Mm -hmm. have come to love it. Uh, it wasn't something that I knew from a very young age that I passionately wanted to pursue. It, It for me was. Uh, the only thing that I felt that I was good at mm-hmm. uh, and that would give me a chance to, you know, to go to college and experience that. And so yeah. that's kind of what it's been, just, you know, from then on. Yeah, not necessarily looking ahead to a long career in the Nah. Just nah. taking it as it comes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And now here you are. <laughs> I mean, what is the, do you now look ahead or are you, I mean, what's the goal? I know you want to. Mm. You're into producing now, and you're you want to get into directing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I directed my first. Um, well, I directed a short film about a year and a half ago, and then I. Oh. Yeah, nobody's seen it, oh, and for I good reason. No, it was a hot mess, but <laughs> but I learned <laughs> you a lot. Directed a stage I directed show it, too. and then I directed a play last yeah. year. Yeah, it's a play called Dutch Masters. That really dope two person play, and we had mm-hmm. a great time doing that. So we actually I directed that while we were shooting High Flying Birds. So we we're doing oh. rehearsing that night after we shot oh, during wow. the daytime. And um, really dug it. And so I have another film now that I want to direct, hopefully later this year, if I can get all the pieces cool. to come together. And um, producing is very much a part of what I want my mm-hmm. life to be about. Um, just because I'm I'm really, you know, really interested in, in agency and how I can create more yeah. um, opportunity, not just for myself, but for other people, you know, like me who are coming up behind me who mm-hmm. want a place to, to, uh, to work. Yeah. It's almost an emerging theme in your characters, mm-hmm. like um, speaking up for for others and for yourself. Certainly yeah. in High Flying Bird. Yeah, which I got to hear about because mm-hmm. it was a, it was an idea of yours. Yeah, sort of. I mean, it yeah. it, um, it it came out of these conversations that Stephen and I were having on on set when we were doing the Nick mm-hmm. a few years ago, and um, you know, I was loving working with him. And I knew that I wanted to continue that collaboration and had all these ideas that I had in my head about what I, you know, things I wanted to do and uh, Mm -hmm. never imagined that I would be close enough to somebody like that. You know what I mean? And then to his credit, he was willing to listen to my ideas and, you know, allow me to sort of pitch him on some things that some good, some not so good. And we developed a friendship and a a conversation that sort of grew out of that. And uh, one of the ideas that I pitched to him was a sports idea that eventually evolved into mm-hmm. into High Flying Bird. And then you also got Terrell on yeah. board. Yeah, Terrell and I go back a long way to uh, mm-hmm. our early days in New York doing theater. And so, you know, when we got when Stephen and I got the idea to the stage where we felt like we wanted a writer to come in okay. and take a pass at it, um, you know, I immediately said, "Well, let's let's bring Terrell in." That's great. And um, at that point, Moonlight hadn't happened yet, so. Stephen didn't know him. Not many people knew him. Uh, but anyway, he came in and started working on it. And Before and, uh, you had even done Moonlight? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah oh we hadn't gosh. done Moonlight yet. We were, uh, no, nah, we had just done theater together at that point. Yeah. yeah. And then we did Moonlight, I think, I don't know, maybe a year later. And then uh, and then all the Moonlight stuff happened. And then Terrell got really busy, of course. And uh, so it took us a while to get the script ready. But yeah. uh, but once the pages started coming in, we were, we were pretty happy with where it was headed. And was it a 13-day shoot? Uh, yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. It was supposed to be. Was it thirteen or twelve? Thirteen, I think it was. It was meant to be fourteen originally, but uh, wow. I think it was thirteen. It may have been twelve. Now that I'm thinking about it, but it was really, really short. Two, you know, a little over two weeks. Wow, yeah. there was a lot of dialogue. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. That's one thing about Tupac. He wrote Moonlight, which doesn't have a lot of dialogue. Sure, but sure. you know, for people who know his plays, man, that brother can write some write some language. So yeah. Um, Did you see Choir Boy? I did. I was actually, yeah. Yeah, it was great, right? It was so good. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I did like an early, early workshop with Choir Boy like oh. eight years ago, a long time ago. Oh, cool. When he first started working on it. But yeah, I love the play. I'm yeah, really so happy good. for him. Yeah. I love just going to the theater and just getting like punched in the face with how good a play is. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. He's so special. <laughs> and it is true that it's, it, the High Flying Bird is quite different. There's something about Steven Soderbergh's movies where like you leave them feeling like, yeah, like everyone's smooth and like mm -hmm. sassy, but like not never quite a character. Like they're yeah. always still within the realm of like human. I yeah, think. yeah. That's a good. That's a good uh, analysis. I think so too. Yeah, I love the Ocean's movies for that same reason. Exactly. Like they all feel like yeah. they're fun and slick, but they also feel like like people to it me. Could happen. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, like it's yeah. yeah, and it's like. As Stephen often says, it's like 11 seconds in the future. Like he always talks about being interested in ideas that are just like a little bit, not like a you know big futuristic idea, but this just like a little bit, oh. a little a little around the corner. 11 yeah. seconds in the future. That's so high flying bird though, because it's a Netflix film. It's filmed on an iPhone. Was there? Did you talk about the iPhone aspect of it with him? Mm -hmm. As yeah. being central to the to the movie. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it a bit. Um, it definitely seemed to um, echo what the film yeah. was trying to say. Yeah. Um, and there is something really, you know, democratic about us all walking around with these phones in our pockets mm -hmm. and presumably all with a story that to tell. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something nice about knowing that, you know what, th there there are fewer barriers now than, than ever yeah. towards getting your story told. And I think it was, um, yeah, there was a sort of, meta meta thing going on in terms of yeah. the, the form and the content uh, of this particular project yeah i like that yeah um i mentioned earlier too that just this incredible directors that you've worked with and because you're getting into directing too like i wonder if we can get into what exactly is good directing in your mind hmm. or like what have you learned from steven versus ava duvernay versus barry jenkins oh man versus yeah, <laughs> i've learned so much yeah and then from the theater directors I've worked with too, oh, I've yeah. learned a ton. But I would say, um, I think good directing from me, for me anyway, from an actor standpoint, is um, involves staying out of the way in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, I don't mean you know, I mean like getting the right people in place, giving those people what they need to do their job, mm -hmm. and then trusting that they can execute their jobs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and that just happens to be how I like to work as an actor. I think so. I really, really respect the actor's process and so as a director that would be first and foremost to me what i learned from steven one of the first things that comes to mind is um the importance of preparation mm. uh he's more prepared than anybody i think i've ever worked with oh. uh but prepared but also equally willing to improvise which is okay. like a really fun uh fun combination oh. ava has this way of um energizing everybody who comes in contact with her. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you go on Ava's set and everybody from like the DP all the way down to like the PA at base camp. Uh -huh. I don't mean to say even down to, I shouldn't even use that word. Sure, you know, sure. Including, the because those people are doing important work as well, but including the PA at base camp, everybody is there because they want to be there. They mm -hmm. believe in the vision and she treats everybody the same. That's my experience. And because mm -hmm. of that, it's... Um, Everybody wants to go that extra mile for mm -hmm. her, you know. Uh, I think that's like a real, a real gift. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I've learned something from from everybody. From I mean, Barry, it's like, man, it's just elegance. Like he has this ah, elegance on yes. set, you know. Yeah. 
Uh, he always, at least one day during a shoot, wears a suit and a tie, you know, oh. which I, I find to be really charming. You know, and I think <laughs> yeah. that's kind of like the, to me, that's a part of what his approach is, too. There's like an elegance and a sophistication yes. to the way that he's constructing the images and like, um, and the way that he even like thinks about the work, you know, mm-hmm. it sort of elevate, we, we all have to sort of elevate ourselves to go, okay, so this is where we are. We're like in this mm-hmm. room. This is where this thing right. lives. Do yeah. you know what I mean? You can't like side up to it kind of in the way that you approach a Shakespeare play you can't side up to it you have to like get in it (laughs) you know what I mean yeah Um, so yeah you can't treat it as low stakes or you can't not Mm -mm. take it seriously Mm -mm. these things this is a responsibility when you're on set with these amazing artists or on stage with these amazing artists exactly and it's a and it's a and it's a gift that we get to do it you know what I mean and we owe it to ourselves and to the people that are going to see it to give it everything that we've got yeah Yeah. and I love the idea too of like a good director will set all that up kind of beforehand Mm -hmm. and certainly give notes but like it is about deciding when to step back or how to how to step back yeah yeah i think so step in when to step in what's about yeah yeah Yeah. because you still get notes on Mm -hmm. set well and i love the idea of the improv too like what happened in high flying bird that was um more changed on the day of rather than prepped most of it was pretty was was well prepped. I mean, the way the script is constructed, if you see it, it's um, I mean, it's very well put together, yeah. and it's so as you said, dialogue heavy. Sure. That um, you know, it took weeks of preparation just to get those words in my mouth mm-hmm. and to feel like I had control over that language cool. and knew what every corner of it was. Um, I would say, like on set, there were some moments towards in the third act of the movie where we, um, it was constructed one way, and then on the day that we were shooting it, Steven and I had a conversation and said, well, wait a minute, wouldn't it be better if like this scene happened this way? Or if, you know, if mm-hmm. Zazie's character had this idea rather than my character having this idea, little things oh, okay. like that, that we sort of cool. changed on the day that, you know, ultimately like impacted the film in a huge way right. um, and yeah. for the better. And I think that's the thing about Steven is that, that openness to improvising and saying, well, mm-hmm. you know, how can we make this thing that much better? And yeah. given that he's editing as he goes, you know, he has the advantage of like, you know, coming in the next day and we can look on the phone or on the monitor and say, well, look at what we did yesterday and how that played. Uh-huh. And it, do you dig what I'm saying? So then we can make decisions going forward in real time yeah. that we don't have to go back and try to fix, you know, months Change later. Change course editing, if you need to. If you have to. Yeah. 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 Based on that kind of ephemeral thing of like the overall feel of a film. Or mm-hmm. like the arc of a story or something. Totally. Or even just like this actor, you know, chose to play this scene yesterday in a way that yeah. we didn't imagine, which was cool. And, and what, cool. how is that going to impact, you know, mm-hmm. the next scene, which we haven't shot yet. So. Totally. And the act and actors have such a unique perspective on their characters where like even basic stuff, like they can simply track their character's journey. In Absolutely. In a way that the director can't always do. Absolutely. But also, yeah, offer. I love when an actor offers new stuff and then everyone else involved is like, oh. It's a new direction. It's mm-hmm. a new. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. And we're all about empowering actors on this podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm with it. Um, can I ask about Harper Road Films? Yeah. Sure. What is the, what's the deal? What's the story? So Harper Road Films is my production company mm-hmm. that uh, I started with my uh, best friend and producing partner, uh, Maurice Anderson. And uh, we have known each other for many many years and he's been sort of in my corner and you know I would say pretty much every decision that I've made in terms of my career I've consulted with him about Um, he has you know the best taste of anybody I've ever met he's uh, the most hard-working person that I know and I trust him Mm. implicitly so we've created this company Uh, we've acquired a number of um, books and articles and things that we're adapting for the screen we're um, working on a number of projects, and wow. High Flying Bird just happens to be the first one that we're okay. getting out into the world. But we've, we're going to follow it up with some um, some other equally interesting fare. Amazing, yeah. Articles, yeah, all kinds of things. I mean, we we both you know read a ton and are yeah. constantly looking for like interesting stories or interesting writers or new voice, anything you know that we want to that we want to do and get behind mm-hmm. and support. And you know, the uh, High Flying Bird is like. The story of the movie is sort of also the ethos of like our company in that we mm-hmm. want to um, make it easier for people to have yes. more control over their material, make mm-hmm. it easier for them to tell the stories that they want to tell, how they want to tell them, mm-hmm. and we want to support that, you know, and um, that, that that's what it's about for us. Yeah. yeah. 
giving giving the actor or giving the artist or the producer or director more agency. Absolutely. Rather than that, and that definitely goes in line with the grabbing an iPhone. Yeah. Filming that. Absolutely, man. Yeah. I yeah, it's a total game changer. It's almost like, I mean, on this podcast and in in my personal my time at backstage, like this era of making your own work. I ask so often for advice, for career advice, and all of that, and it's almost like early career artists no longer have an excuse to mm-hmm. not create your own material yeah. when it's here on your phone. Yeah, you can't totally. say, <laughs> I don't know, a studio's not going to take a meeting with me. Like, no, mm-hmm. you can actually just set out and tell your story right and then. And just do it. Yeah. 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 Um, amazing. <laughs> it's funny when you said backstage, just then it reminded me. I <laughs> did you so, use backstage? Did I? Man, I was obsessed with backstage. Yes. I'll tell you. So when I when, <laughs> when I was in out in uh, college in Florida, I discovered backstage, and I used to go to the yes. to the library and read it, you know, all the time. And I read the casting notices and and like fantasize about moving to New York one day and getting uh-huh. the, you know to audition. And so I ended up subscribing to backstage, and so I used to get the uh, get the magazine every, or the paper every week. Yeah. And uh, this is when it was a paper, you know yep. what I mean? Yep. And. Um, <laughs> A funny story. One one night, I was I was uh, I had been taking this theater history class, and I was writing a paper, and I was in the university library, and and I used an article or something from backstage, and oh. I took my uh, I needed to cite it, right, to cite the paper as a source. Yes. And so it was late night, like one o'clock in the morning. The library was closing. I had all these books spread out on the on the table, and the the you know librarian came around and said, "All right, we're gonna be closing in you know five minutes. Everyone pack up their books and get out of here, basically." Uh-huh. And so I quickly put all my stuff away, and the, uh, I had grabbed a, a copy of Backstage, you know, I stuck it in my bag and took off home. And when I was leaving, the alarm went off uh, at the library, oh. and so I thought, "What oh. in the world?" So I go through my bag and and. Uh, and I pull out this copy of Backstage, and it turns out that accidentally I had picked up the library's copy of it, thinking that it was mine because I had the same one at home. You know, I glanced at the cover and thought, oh, well, that's, you know, it's mine because I've seen it on my coffee table. So yeah. um, anyway, so I, of course, said, look, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, 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 You know what yeah. I mean? Um, long story short, the woman takes my college ID, and she says, uh, sit down. I'll be back in a minute. 10, 15 minutes goes by, and I go up to her, and I say, listen, I, I got to get home and finish this paper. Can you? Can you give me my ID back so I can go home? Uh-huh. And she said, well, sir, just sit down. The police will be here in a minute. Are you serious? I'm serious. No. So she called the police. They came. And I ended up getting arrested and going to jail over your magazine. Are you so, <laughs> I promise. Spent the night you in got Tallahassee Police Department. Okay, I thought this story was going to be, but like, I was like, we're going to use this for promotional purposes. Uh, you so can great. cut that part you out. Went but to yeah. Jail? yeah. Yeah. I sure did. The librarian sent you to jail. Well, the police came. It was a longer story. The police came yeah. and they asked me to make a statement and I told them what happened and they said, well, you know, write everything down and sign it. And, you know, and I said, well, what, what does this mean? Am I like admitting guilt? And they're like, we're well, just here to take your statement. Just sign it, sign it for them. And I said, well, you know what? If if you can't tell me like what this means, then I think I should probably not sign this. And they said, you this have the right nightmare. to remain silent. Anything you say. And anyway, it's just a funny story. About backstage. That's devastating. Uh, but I'm committed to your paper. <laughs> clearly, well, I've clearly suffered so for backstage. Yeah, that you had so <laughs> many copies of backstage that you could keep track of. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I love and hate that story. I know, I'm me so too. I'm so sorry that that yes. happened. No, man, but <laughs> well, here we are now. And and, uh, <laughs> and you were on the cover of backstage. I was on the cover of it, yeah. So there you go. But truly, like it really, having access to the paper meant so much to me, like being, you know, so far from New York. It, like I used to read it all the time and like I was just obsessed right. with it. And yeah, and so it, thank you guys. I mean, is it safe to say that, that I love the idea of that we've heard the, those who are not in New York and LA, yeah, they're exposed to backstage and it's part of the building fantasy of, of moving to New York. Right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really cool. It was really cool. Do you guys still do those like audition notices? Are oh they yeah, still the a casting part notices of the, the casting very notices, much yeah. so. Every okay. issue, it's very much online now, and everyone sets up their online profile and I see. filter results to only have wow. casting notices appear that you would fit for. Wow, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's changed. It's changed a lot. So, But you then you then moved to New York, and you kept using Backstage. Yeah, like, I did. Tell me about those early days of the struggling artist in New York. Mm-hmm. That's what we like to hear about. Yeah, it was so. The first year after after college, I went to London. Actually, I lived there for a year and uh, took classes and um, huh. saw, saw a lot of plays. And then I came back to New York and 
um, hustled for a while. Yeah. And backstage was very much a part of that hustle. I would get the paper and when I could afford it. And uh, sure, at times at times were tight. And yeah. Um, and yeah, go to any audition that I could find. You mm-hmm. know, uh, at the Equity Building a lot, waiting in line and yeah. trying to like you know. This was for plays, mostly. Plays, yeah. Um, actually, only plays because I never. Okay. I never at that point imagined that I'd ever have a career doing television or film, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so just for plays. And, cool. and so I'd audition for anything I can get my hands on. Like, yeah. didn't get a lot, but we, uh, some friends of mine and I put up a, a French show, which oh nice. I think we maybe advertised in my sure. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Yeah. But anyway. That's um, cool. Yeah, you'd always find me with a copy of the paper in my back pocket. So. That's amazing. Um, I have one here in my bag. Is that right? Okay. The, um, <laughs> What was then this, the break? How, how did you transition out of the out of those the early days? Mm. Putting on the did the Fringe show? What was the Fringe show about? It was a play called Redhead that a friend of mine, Matt Holsclaw, wrote, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we went to college together. And he wrote this play for myself and several of our other classmates to be in. And so we put it together with cool. our own money and ran it for maybe like three or four performances. And you know, it was really a yeah, good time. I but love that. yeah, you know, not many people came, but we had a great time doing exactly. it. So. Uh, and then I ended up going to grad school. Oh, right, right, right. At NYU. At NYU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was like a you know fluke as well. But it happened and uh-huh. got in. And uh, and those three years were incredibly important. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the tools I gained as an actor and also like the community that I sure. built. Um, yeah, has been really, really special it to me. It sounds like you build communities wherever you go. I try to, man. Yeah. I try to. I'm from a small community and, you know, I try to surround myself with good folks and you yeah. know what I mean and, and try to contribute as much as I can to communities sure so uh, yeah well and I'm interested in that what you said earlier about talking with Steven Soderbergh once you got to the point at in the Nick where you were close enough to essentially pitch him mm-hmm. and the kind of gray area between pitching someone professionally and being their friend like mm-hmm. on a personal it feels like those two things are often in the arts they're not there's not a clear delineation between them. I'm a professional and then I'm your buddy. Yeah. Like you how does that process go for you? Well, in this case it was really um it went really easy because it it sort of so working together, right? I I knew going in that I definitely wanted to learn as much from him as sure. I possibly could and so and I was really forward about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I normally am not, but for some reason I found the courage to say, "Hey, I really is it cool if I like shadow you a little bit and like, you know, I'd ask him questions about why he's choosing a certain lighting setup sure. or whatever, and he was nice enough to share with That's me his cool. ideas. And and then we started exchanging books. Mm-hmm. Um, I gave him a copy of one of my favorite books for his birthday, uh, and then he he really liked it. And you know, we started you know talking about that. And then he gave me a book, and so you know, th- there was naturally a friendship that was evolving. But a part of that friendship was like. Um, discussing politics and ideas and our ambitions and things. So it wasn't like a, the two things were sort of, mer- you know, yeah. intertwined. Yeah. And so it just sort of, the conversation about working together just kind of extended naturally out of that. Yeah. And yeah. I guess if your work is, I mean, if you're passionate about your work, which is the goal, I feel like, mm-hmm. yeah. then everything you talk about that you're passionate about is related to the work you're doing with that person. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I, yeah. And now, now I will say that in other instances with other people, I can, yeah. I've had, I found it to be a little bit trickier because I'm I'm not good at mm. asking for things. That's something that I am working on mm-hmm. is improving. Uh-huh. You know my uh, courage in that department. I'm usually yeah. like, you know, if I can't do it by myself, then I just won't do it. Or I won't have it. Uh-huh. Um, mm. So I'm getting better at sticking my neck out in that way. But mm. um, but there have been some times where I've sort of felt like the lines get a bit blurry. You know, yep. when you're friends with someone and then you say, hey, you know, I really want to work on this Can thing. We Can we, something? Yeah. yeah, or like I need you to help me, you know, write this thing or I need your, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it can get a little bit great. But what I'm finding is that like, you know, sometimes the like courage and the bravery and just asking is enough to make people say, "Okay, absolutely, like I'm 100% in, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Nine times out of ten, if the decision is to ask or not ask, maybe mm-hmm. just ask. Just do it and, yeah, See exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, Because what's the worst that could happen? Exactly, exactly. Steven Soderbergh's going to stop talking to you? Like, yeah, I know, I know, no. yeah. But he's, I got to say, man, I can't say enough about that dude. He, like, really, like, opened his, like, it just opened everything to me. I remember there was a time when, like, 
we were talking about uh, we we're talking about a particular shot on set, mm-hmm. and he said, "Oh, this is like a French over," as the term we used. And I was like, "A French over? What is a French over?" Yeah, I don't know what that is. And he was like, "Oh, it's like," and he described the shot to me. And I was like, "You know, man, I was like, that's something that I, I wish I knew more about, you know, shot compositions." And uh-huh. he was like, "Well, that's easy." He was like, "Why don't you just come over one day? We'll put a movie on, any movie you want, and we'll go through shot by shot, and I'll explain oh. to you what each shot is and why." the filmmaker chose that and we'll talk about editing patterns and we'll talk about rhythm and tempo all this stuff and i was like really it's like yeah no problem like truly any movie he can just do that with he just he's brilliant and like and Uh but the point is that he's so generous with me you know what i mean and to that point i hadn't found anybody who was who uh, i guess i hadn't asked probably it's probably my fault but but um i just found it really touching that he was willing to be so kind with me yeah it's a kindness thing it's not even a um I'll do you a favor, you do me a favor. It's not transactional. Nah, he's yeah. not like that. He's yeah. just like, you know, you're interested, I'm interested, let's like talk about this. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's as it should be. And you've that, it's, you've worked with such amazing directors. And I can't wait to see what's next. What is mm. next? Well, um, so Harp, my company, Harper Row, we're producing a number of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully we'll get some... some uh, yeses very soon yes and then i'll have some more specifics to announce yeah i want to do my asking um and on the acting side i'm i'm taking a little bit of a of a break okay Um, not a not a hard break but i'm just not i've never been really um i mean i am ambitious right but i'm also very selective i think about the things that i get involved in and so um so I'm not in a, I used to be in a bit of a hurry about mm-hmm. things, and so I'm trying to practice being in less of a hurry. So I'm gonna take a little time. I'm gonna spend some time with my with my family down in mm-hmm. Alabama, and um, spend some time with myself and trying to work through some things on my own that I need to work through. And um, and I trust that like the universe will send something along that sure. will will um, you know speak to me. And then yeah. if that happens, then I'll be I'll be ready to rock. Yeah. Yeah. You're at the point in your career where you, where you can be selective, but it also sounds like that's that's part of who you are is to be patient and and picking the stuff that speaks to you. Yeah, I the think so. The collaborators that speak to you too. I think so, man. I think so. I think it for me. I mean, everything I do and everything I do teaches me something about myself. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and in some ways, I think that the projects that have come along for me happened to come along at a time when I needed that particular thing. Yeah. Um, cool. Like Moonlight, it was it came at a time when I felt, you know, like uh, vulnerability was something that I was interested in exploring and oh. second chances, and you know yes. what I mean? And so that came along. I thought, this is what I need to be dealing with right now. And then High Flying Bird, it, it came out of like this feeling of, like I said before, you know, uh, agency and, yeah. and, and uh, taking charge and asking for things and cool. being a bit braver. So I think that whatever comes next will hopefully be in line with with um, with where I am. With where you are, yeah. yeah. Um, and the way you said it earlier was all the moonlight stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I would yeah. be remiss if I didn't ask about like the moment mm-hmm. at the Oscars where the wrong picture was uh, announced as best picture. Yeah. Uh, Barry Barry did describe it as a little bit of a PTSD thing of like he still sort of can't believe that it happened and it mm-hmm. really changed the course of his life in a way. Yeah. Like what do you remember about that moment or what happened? Hmm. Well, I remember uh, I remember sitting there and and, and um, when they announced it, I remember looking into the wings of the theater and I could see people were sort of sc- scrambling a little bit and I uh-huh. thought Some, something's going on and. Next to me was the stage manager who had on these white gloves who all along had been like slowly counting people down as they were making their speeches oh four, wow. three. And then I saw his gloves kind of waving frantically like, stop, stop. I thought, something's up. I don't know what it oh, is. he knew. He, he knew. I think out. he was getting, yeah, someone was speaking to him. And so anyway, he, um, when they finally corrected it, um, it was it was surreal. It was a really yeah. kind of odd moment. And uh, it went by really, really fast. Um, mm-hmm. But I think also, if I'm honest, like as as amazing as it was, um, for and I don't mean to sound cheesy, but for me, you know, the fact that people saw the movie and liked the movie yeah. and talked about the movie oh, yeah. was was the most important thing to me. And the award stuff is I have a weird relationship with all of that. Sure, you know what I mean. I think 
it's an odd feeling being in a room when everybody's telling you how great you are. I think that's a that's a slippery yeah. slope. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And so there's a part of me that always felt a little like, you know, I wanted to just a little back footed about it, you mm-hmm. know. So I enjoyed it and it was really amazing experience and I'm glad the film got the recognition and Barry and Terrell and Mahershala mm-hmm. and everybody. Yeah. Um but but uh, you know, I try to keep it in, in perspective. It was just one night, you know what I'm saying? And, and oh, yeah. um Yeah, I wanna get back to work. That's all I it's wanted to do that to work. Let's, yeah, let's yeah. get back to work. Yeah. There's a few other industries where that happens, the like l- tons of ceremonial patting on the back mm-hmm. and it's interesting you call it a slippery slope. Mm-hmm. Is fame, I mean, that's fame, right? I think so. It's part of that, that that's a slippery slope. It can yeah. be unhealthy. Yeah. Can't believe what, can't always believe what people say about you, uh-huh. you know, good or bad. You sure. know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and you got to so, read yeah. the good reviews and the bad reviews. Yeah. I mean, you try to stay away from all of them, but, you know, right. if you start reading the good ones, then, you know, and yeah. believe in that mess, then you got to start, then you got to read the bad ones and yeah, hear right. what they say too. And you get caught in that place, then I think it hampers creativity and it, mm-hmm. you know, puts you in your head. And I think when you're a creative person, you want to be in your heart. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I like that advice. Either, either um, if you're going to read the, or get feedback to mm-hmm. the good and the bad, but maybe it's better to not and to step back and keep your focus on yourself. I think so. I think so. To me, that's what's, that's what's healthy. Because yeah. also a lot of times people who, you know, I mean, no, no tea, no shade, but a lot of times people who, who you know, who uh, write about these things don't always know what they're looking at. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I do. They yes. don't, they writing about, yeah, they don't know what they're watching. No. They don't know what the actor's process actually is. Yes. So, you know what I mean? Or what a French over is. Oh, wait. <laughs> well, I don't know what that is either, but, or I didn't, <laughs> yes, but, but right. you dig what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. You know. And it's the internet, so everybody has that voice. They all, which yeah. Is great. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It sounds like it's all about, for you, where you are in your, in your journey, which does sound really cheesy, but like where you are, what you need in this moment, and if there's a role that comes along that feeds that, then great. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not angling or trying to, you yeah. know, be a big star or get the next thing or. Right. You know what I mean, they can have it. I'm not. I'm not here for that. Like, yeah. I want to become the best actor that I can be, and yes. okay. even more importantly, I want to be um, the best person that I can be. Mm-hmm. And and um, I'm realizing that that takes a lot of work, and so I'm here for it. Here to yeah. do that work. Yeah. Like, don't ignore the work of being a person by, yeah, getting caught up in the industry. Yeah. Which would be very distracting. I oh guess. yeah. Yeah. It'll be distracting and you get kicked down the stairs a couple of times. And if you don't know who you are, then, you know, mm. anyway, it's slippery slope. Well, we are always, yeah, we're always interested in that aspect of two of the projection and like, just yeah. how do you shoulder it? Especially in your early career days of, I guess it is about knowing who you are so that when you get kicked down the stairs, you're able yeah, to right. back up. Exactly. Yeah. And having a community of people that can support you when you mm-hmm. fall. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then having a having the courage and the agency, right, to, to try and create your own opportunities. Mm-hmm. You know, not just be sitting around waiting on somebody to call you, you know, because it's I don't know, man, it's a tough it's a tough grind, you know? Yeah. It's a tough grind. Ain't nobody getting discovered at the mall no more. So I think <laughs> no. you know what I mean? So I think yeah. you gotta if I was a young actor starting out right now, the thing I would focus mostly on would be finding a community of people who I want to work with and then finding ways to get our work our work done. Mm-hmm. Even if that's, you know, wherever that happens, you know, like yeah. put it out there, make it, you know, don't wait. Don't wait. Yeah. That's excellent advice. Yeah. Um, what about, and we asked specifically about audition advice too, because mm-hmm. I mean, in all these roles, and you talked about being picky, or not, not picky, but like, selective in terms of what you want to how often are you auditioning for a part and how often is it um how did you get moonlight i auditioned i put myself on tape for it and you knew you wanted it Mm -hmm. with all these roles it sounds like you really you want them yeah because they're for you yeah yeah it feels personal to me and moonlight you know terrell had let me read an early draft of the play probably 10 years or eight years ago eight years prior So I knew of it for a long mm-hmm. time, and so as soon as I saw cool. it, you know, it was his. I knew it was his piece, and then Barry, who I had been a fan of, mm-hmm. who also Stephen and I had spoken about on set, you know, okay, as being cool. like a really interesting young director. Um, I knew I wanted to do it, so yeah. So I put myself on tape uh, a couple of times, I think, <laughs> and Barry, okay. yeah, and 
and then I, yeah, I got the call and, and was eager to do it. But it's a bit of a mix, you know, like there are um, a lot of times nowadays it's more um, offers, which I'm grateful for. Yeah. But then there's also times when I'm asked to read for things, which I'm also grateful for, sure. you know, and I know, I know some actors feel a bit like, I, why should I have to read for this? And But I don't mind reading. And in a, in a way, it's actually, it's good practice, number one, mm-hmm. you know, which... If you want to be a better actor, why not take a take a, you know take an opportunity to practice? And then also, I think it it kind of lays the groundwork for the director and the people you're going to be working with as like, hey, this is my take on the character, mm-hmm. you know, and I want to make sure that you're okay with that before yeah. I turn up on set and you know what I mean. I start doing yeah. what I think is right. Then we have a whole miscommunication. Like, let me show you what I'm thinking, and then we could talk about that. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's a mix. Yeah, you got to see yeah. if it's a match. Artistically, the artistic sensibility should be the same. The if your take on the character makes sense with the, with the director, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of audition advice, which you said, I would say that yeah. the thing I the thing if I could go back, you know, to ten years ago, the thing I would try to uh, tell myself is to be um, not try to just not 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 be so dutiful, right? Not try to mm-hmm. be so. Um, Dutiful is the word to the mm-hmm. script, right? And I, I don't I mean not to the script, but not not try to be what I think the people want yeah. the character to oh, be or okay. want me to be, right? Not try to be a, a great actor, you know, mm, but to yeah. just to just try to be good, you know, and then just try to be honest, hmm. and to try to lend some authentic part of myself mm-hmm. to every audition, and if they don't like it, or you're not the one they want. You can walk out of there with your head held high, knowing that you you offered something authentic. But when you go in there and you try to be, you know, oh, you know, this is what I think they want, or mm-hmm. you're looking at the other people in the waiting room and thinking, well, he looks like that and he wore that, so I'm gonna try to do something different to like catch their attention. Oh. It just doesn't ring true, you know. So I think, yeah, be be honest. You know what I mean? Give offer something honest in the room is what I would say. Yeah. And that's good practice. That's excellent. You know I mean? And it's definitely, yeah, it's practice. It's yeah. it's more um, work almost to do the thing of like trying to shake it up or do somebody else or compare yourself to other oh, people. Man, so much work. It's yeah. so much work. And you and it doesn't lead anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Right. And also like y- y- the thing you think, again, like I listen, I ain't no guru. So I'm just telling you what I think. You what, are. If I, no, not at all. I, I stress not at all, man. I don't know much at all. But, but I'm just saying if I was telling myself, mm-hmm. you know, what yeah. I would say is, you know, Every audition, you're not you're not actually auditioning for the thing that you think you're auditioning for. Mm-hmm. You dig? So you go in for a play at the Rattlestick Theater. Mm-hmm. You might think you're auditioning for that part. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. really, you're auditioning for you know down the line. Absolutely. You understand? Because yeah. the number of times when I've gotten calls from casting directors who say, "Man, I remember that audition you came in yeah. with seven years ago. Years ago, you didn't get the part, yeah. but I remember you were really you were prepared and you made really good choices and you know you were good in the room." And mm-hmm. so I wanted to bring you back in for this thing, you know, Wonderful. that, like, that's what you auditioned for. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's easy. That helps, too, with the sting of rejection. Totally. That totally. Down the line, that could easily come into something else. Absolutely. Any of those people in that room could get you the next big job. Or the Absolutely. Next, yeah. Absolutely. And you got to be, last thing I'll say, I'm not even like an advice mode, but the last thing I'll say is be good to people. Be good, oh, to, be good so to everybody you meet because, okay. you know, the, the number of people that I have come across who, you know, were junior A or answering phones at this agency, you know, one week, a few years down the line, they run in the talent department. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So if you if you if you're good to everybody, you know, I think that that'll that'll come back to you. And I'm not trying to say I always am. You know, I've made mistakes too. You dig what I'm sure. you dig what I mean? But um but I think I think that's a good thing to try is to that's be fun. to be good to that's, folks. Yeah. Yeah. That was like primo advice after primo advice after primo advice. We're gonna <laughs> cut it, print it. Oh man! Um, thank you so much for joining thank you, us. Man. This was awesome. Thank you. I appreciate Can you having. Parting me. words of wisdom for listeners. <sighs> oh man! Um, parting words. Well, I borrow from my favorite playwright, August Wilson. And I'll say, <gasps> "Gotta take the crookeds with the straights." <laughs> Look that one up. In the Envelope is recorded in New York City at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, tweet us at In the Envelope, leave a review. We want to hear from you. 
Visit Backstage.com for more content and resources for working artists. And don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with a free trial by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout. Thanks, as always, to podcast producer Wiz, Jamie Muffet. You can follow him on Twitter at JamieMusicNYC. You can follow me, Jack Smart, on Twitter at JackSmartWrites. Thank you to the team at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. Peter Rappaport, Mark Stinson, Samantha Sherlock, Francis Ramos, Lauren Rout, Caitlin Watkins, Rowan al and especially, should-be Oscar nominee, Casey Howe. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.